Today's message, and I, and I failed to get it written up on the board, and it's long enough, I won't take the time now, but it's a question. Is dispensational right division a modern invention? Is dispensational right division a modern invention? And so a few of you uh, were here several weeks ago when I gave a lesson titled, Is the Rapture a Modern Invention? And, and in that lesson, I, um, I mentioned the fact that it would be interesting to do one on dispensationalism or dispensational doctrine, dispensational thought in general. And so that's what I'm doing this morning. And in fact, I was kind of surprised on the YouTube channel how much interest that video has already just is is uh, the rapture a modern invention and there's many on the, there's some a number of comments um, on that that video YouTube uh, some in many in support of the message I had given but some in opposition because obviously not everyone uh, views it the same way. Some people think that the, the rapture is, the pre-trib rapture specifically, is an invention. And it's something relatively modern, and it's not supported biblically. Now, it's, it's kind of fascinating that one of the, the most vocal people on the, the comment section against that, I was able to discern that he was a Roman Catholic. So, of course, they would be very much against the concept of the rapture of the church. They're, they're very much against dispensational thought because they're very much inclined to believe the church, their church, has replaced Israel. It's just an extension that grew out of Israel. So anyway, we're going to deal with some of that today. Um, so this message is kind of related to that last one, uh, dealing with the pre-trib rapture, because the pre-trib rapture of the church is, a, is an integral part of dispensational doctrine. So this is going to be uh, similar in some ways, but we're going to kind of take it a little different direction as well. And just like the rapture that I mentioned is connected to John Nelson Darby, so is dispensational doctrine as a, as a general rule is oftentimes associated with John Nelson Darby. Now he lived back in the 1800s uh, and perhaps in the early 1800s, and he started writing uh, wrote extensively, and so he promoted a pre-trib rapture of the church. But he also, in, in, in all that, it's because he was dispensational. He understood that the church, the body of Christ, and what God was doing today was different than what God had done through Israel, and so therefore there was a dispensational change. And so John Delsa Darby was right about a lot of that. And so in some circles he's called the father of dispensationalism. Now, that's not really true, and we'll explain why later, but he is, in modern times, one to write extensively about it and to, to make it more widely known, perhaps. <clears throat> now, in, in, in dealing with this, uh, this concept of, of dispensational doctrine, the idea that God has dealt with different people differently at different times throughout history. So I think it's in Hebrews uh, chapter 1 where it talks about God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake to people in time past. And so, so that verse right there indicates that God didn't, hasn't always dealt exactly the same with every person, with every group, but He has done different things at different times. And, and there's a reason for that. I mean, there's... Um, we talk about the different ages. I've done a lesson on the long-suffering of God through the ages of time and how God is doing different things so ultimately He can prove to humanity that it wasn't God's fault for their failures. Because through every different age, man largely has failed to accept what God was offering. And so... So I think the Bible clearly indicates that God has changed His dealings with men. And so we're going we're to look at that a little bit. So anyway, the, the whole idea of dispensational doctrine does seem to be, on the surface, a modern thing. Anyway, I remember a number of years ago, I was sharing some, some information about dispensational view of the Bible 
right division, as we call it sometimes, rightly dividing the word of truth, according to Second uh, Timothy 2.15, and I could sense that he he didn't like it. He didn't he didn't um, he didn't appreciate what I was sharing. Didn't agree with it. And he so he gave me three things that he uses as a criteria to determine the truth of a doctrine. And so I've thought about those since because other people maybe don't say it exactly like that. But this is this is not an uncommon way to think. And so what he says, he says, I look at the Bible first to see what the Bible teaches. He says, then, no, secondly, I look at the universal church. So not just maybe my local church, but what is the church across the world as a whole, what is their stand on this issue or this doctrine? And he said, thirdly, I look at church history. What has been the historical position of Bible-believing Christians throughout history? So he said, I look at those three things to determine whether a doctrine is, is, should be believed or embraced or, or whatnot. Well, the problem is, with the information I was sharing with him, it didn't fit all three of those categories. He could look at the universal church, and the universal church has not been on board with dispensational doctrine. And the history of the church, we look at church history and the writings for the last perhaps 2,000 years, there's not much until modern times dealing with dispensational truth. And so, I don't know what his intentions were, but it felt like that this was an easy way for him to dismiss what I was saying. Not that my words had any importance, but I was trying to share Scripture with him. But th th that view has several glaring problems. And so we're going we're to look at those three things and point out the, the problems with that. And, and, and I'll state them up front, and then we'll look at them more in detail. <clears throat> and we'll kind of help arrive at a conclusion, is dispensational doctrine a modern invention? And, and, and the number one problem is the Bible is the only and the absolute and the final authority of all things regarding faith and doctrine and spiritual matters. And so by him adding those other two things was undermining the very first thing of the authority of the Bible. The, the second thing is the, 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 the number two issue of the universal church the, the, the believers across the world, wherever they are, and looking at what they believe, we can show, and we will, we'll look at the Bible briefly, the majority has always been wrong. And, and you, can, you can say that about a, a whole number of things, but, but especially spiritual things. The majority has always been wrong. And then thirdly, when we look at the, the church history, what's the historical position of believers on a particular issue? Church history has largely been controlled by a, an organization that has, that has used heavy-handed, authoritative, and, and dogmatic rule and demanding submission to what they have taught. Now, if you haven't caught on, I'm specifically speaking of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in saying that, I have some good Roman Catholic friends. In fact, I'm thinking of a particular friend who is a... I think he's a... To my knowledge, he's a Bible-loving and for sure God-fearing, and he loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's evident in his, in his life, in his heart. So I'm not putting a point a blanket condemnation on every Roman Catholic. I am saying the organization is wrong. The organization has been anti-Bible and anti-Christian, anti-Christ throughout history. That's what I am saying. The organization is a problem. And the organization has persecuted Bible-believing Christians, killed Bible-believing Christians in, in mass throughout history. 
they have controlled the Christian history until modern times. So we're going to look at that a little bit more too. So that, that is a problem. If we think about church history having a valid weight in determining the truth of something. Now, I will say this, in case I forget to say it later. If we want to look at what the majority of believers think about a certain doctrine or something, that can be informative. But that shouldn't, that shouldn't carry weight as to whether we believe it or not. If we want to look at church history to see what has been the historical position on a matter, that can be informative, but that should not carry weight as to whether we believe that or not. So we want, to, we want to think about that as we go. But first of all, we're going to deal with the authority of the Bible. This is foundational. This is fundamental. This, I cannot stress this enough. Because in, in uh, and I can't remember exactly the psalm, maybe a Psalm 122, I don't remember for sure. It says, God has exalted His word above all His name. Now, I wish I could remember the exact reference. But God has exalted His Word above all His name. And we, and we th maybe marvel at that, but do you know what? God's reputation, God's glory, God's, God's trustworthiness, everything hinges on His Word. If His Word can be broken, if, it can, if one jot or one tittle can fail which Jesus promised it never would, but if anything about His Word can be destroyed or nullified or canceled or proven to be a lie, it destroys God's character. It destroys God's glory. It is, it's devastating to the person and the glory of God. So He says, I have magnified My Word above all My name. We find that Word in the scriptures in the Bible. So I invite you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now there are a number of passages we could turn to, probably, uh, probably a dozen really good passages to deal with the authority of the Bible. And, and they would all be worthwhile. But this verse alone, in dealing with the authority of the Bible, this is the only verse I'm going to turn to specifically about Scripture in general because I think that it is exhaustive enough to deal with everything in this one passage. Here, in this, And we're going to read several verses. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 13. And it's interesting that Paul starts out warning about the direction that the dispensation of grace is going to, to go, the direction it's going to head. And he talks about the latter days, and he says in verse 13, but he says, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, he's not just talking about only the world of unbelievers out there that never darken a church door. He is also including those who call themselves Christians. And the trend is going to be that they will, that they will wax worse and worse. Wax means to grow, expand, deceiving and being deceived. Now, in light of that, in light of that deception, in light of the evil that's going to continue to grow and to mount in the dispensation of grace, Verse 14 is brought forth. He says, But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now that's an interesting thing because Paul here is telling Timothy, he said things are going to get worse and worse. Deception is going to come. But, Timothy, continue in the things that you have learned and the things that you have been assured of knowing of whom you have learned it. How do you learn it? From the Apostle Paul. You see, because Apostle Paul is the Apostle to the Gentiles. He has the specific doctrine for today. So that's got to be, first and foremost, understood in order for you to maintain the right doctrine. Otherwise, if you get sucked back into thinking you're Israel's replacement, 
or you're under one of Israel's covenants, you're going to be deceived. And so the first thing is to understand, so there's a spiritual principle for us as well. We learn the things specifically regarding today. We learn that we're not living in the signs of the times because of Paul. And, and, and we understand that he is the apostle of the Gentiles. Verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. So here he, he brings in the Scriptures. He says, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So here the Scriptures are able to bring wisdom to a person, spiritual wisdom, and ultimately bringing someone to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 16, <clears throat> that verse alone imparts a very great importance to Scripture to bring wisdom that results in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's very important. But verse 16, all Scripture, so now we're looking at the totality of the Bible. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means it's God-breathed. That means every word in the Bible is met with approval from God. God breathed. Either He spoke it directly or His Holy Spirit spoke it to the, apostles, the prophets which wrote it down. Now, and the Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That... So here's the conclusion. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, just a side note. The man of God includes you ladies. In the Bible, when it talks about a specific man, it can mean male. But when it talks about man in general, it means like we would normally say mankind. And that's the way it means here. So the man of God is any man or woman of God. So the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, that word perfect does not mean sinless perfection. That word perfect means complete. It means whole. It means having everything. And thoroughly furnished is very similar. Now, we might use we might hear that word regarding a house that's furnished or an apartment. You go to rent an apartment that is either furnished or unfurnished or, or even a condo. We've, you know, our family has done that before where you rent a condo and it's fully furnished. That means that when you move into that apartment or a condo that's furnished, you don't have to go to the furniture store to buy furniture. You don't have to go to the, 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 um, the hardware store to buy supplies, to finish up the, the building process. And you don't have to go buy carpet. And you don't have to, you don't have to go buy towels and, and, and bedroom supplies as far as the, the, the bed or the linens. and every, Everything is furnished. It means you move right in and you can live just like it's home. Fully furnished means everything has been supplied for you. For your, at your disposal. Another way to look at it is tools. When a contractor goes out to the job site, a lot of times they take a van, a work van, or a work truck, or a, a, some tool bags, or they wear a tool belt because they want everything they need, they want to be fully furnished with the tools they need to complete the job. Now, this doesn't mean, this doesn't say partially furnished. Thoroughly furnished. So when we're talking about the Scriptures here. It says all Scripture is given, and then we fast forward to this verse, that the man of God may be perfect, that means complete, and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So now, to be a man of God, to, to have everything you need to walk in good works and live according to the will of God, to honor God, to glorify God with your life, do you need the Scriptures and church tradition? Do you need the Scriptures and the pastor's authority? Do you need the church 
uh, creeds. Do you need? No. The scripture is given that the man of God might be perfect, that means complete, and truly furnished. That doesn't allow for anything else. You see, you and I come together and we edify one another and that's an important part of Christian living. But what's the basis of our edification? Scripture. The Scriptures are the only thing and everything that it takes for a, for a person to be a man or a woman of God and to honor Him. And, and this verse doesn't allow for for more. The Bible, as the totality of Scripture, is the complete and final authority. You know, even Jesus, when He was tempted of Satan, what did He appeal to? He says, it is written. Satan tempted Him three times. Three times Jesus says, it is written. Because that was, even for the Lord Jesus Christ, He appealed to that as the ultimate authority. It is written. The pastor is not the authority. I am not the authority. All I'm doing is stirring up your minds according to the Word of God, and the more that you have your nose in the book, the, the more that will benefit you. But... All of you should take anything a pastor says and verify it according to the Word of God. The pastor is not the authority. The church is not the authority. The pope is not the authority. Creeds are not the authority. In fact, some of us, as the uh, so, some of us elders, have met in this assembly to talk about a, a statement of faith, even to put on our website. We have been very hesitant. And, and I think we finally put something very concise. Because you know what will happen? A church can, with such good intention, put together a statement of faith or a creed by which they stand by, and maybe there's just, maybe it's 95% true, and unbeknownst to them, they've got 5% error in there. And time goes on, the next generation is, as, is, is the, the leaders in the church now. And someone says, you know what? I think that's not quite accurate in our statement of faith. And other people stand up and say, oh, what do you mean? That's our, our fathers put that together. We're not deviating from that because they stood for the truth. Do you see what just happened? They got away from the authority of God in that scenario. And that's so easy. The scriptures are the authority. <clears throat> and it doesn't matter if something can be shown wrong from the Scriptures or an error, a doctrine, whatever it is, can be shown wrong from the Scriptures. It doesn't matter who believed the doctrine or how many people were promoting it or what authority structures out there that demand adherence to it. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's wrong. And so that's our goal is to stick with and only with the Word of God as the authority. So now, that gives this verse, I believe, is, is so complete, so rich. The Scripture is given that the man of God might be perfect and truly furnished. So that's what we're all about. That's what we should be all about, the Scripture. That's how we know more about God. That's how we know personally and intimately the Lord Jesus Christ is because of what the Scripture tells us. Now, as we bring this to bear to, in the dispensational thought, we can turn over to uh, maybe a familiar verse in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> and remember, the title of the, the message is Dispensational uh, Right Division, a Modern Invention. Now look at this verse or these verses here. Ephesians chapter 3, we'll start in verse 1. It says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, 
If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, now notice, so here's a dispensational, the, the word dispensation is here. It's a dispensation of the grace of God. Now notice what Paul says. Given me to you word. He's just addressed them as Gentiles. He said, I, he had said in Romans, he says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. He didn't magnify himself. He magnified his office, his, his God-given responsibility. And he says, this dispensation of grace was given me to you, Gentiles. Now, Paul is the only author in Scripture that writes directly to Gentiles as a, as a whole, as a people group. And that's, there's a reason for that. Now, verse 3, it says, How by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a few, uh, four in few words. And now the mystery is just hidden information. It's hidden wisdom. And it's something that God kept hidden until a specific time. And then when he reveals it, it's revealed as a mystery. It's labeled a mystery. This is new information. So that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, according to this verse, we should be able to arrive at some conclusions. Is the idea of dispensational doctrine, the idea of different dispensations, is that man's idea or God's idea? It's God's idea. God inspired the Word of God, and He gave, it clearly gave unto Paul a dispensation of the grace of God. And it said it was something that was, it was not known previously. It was a mystery. And it was given to Paul. Now, <clears throat> So we could ask the question, who was responsible for making that known to the entire world? It was the Apostle Paul. So it was God's idea. He invested it in the Apostle Paul. That's why Paul had such a special calling in the book of Acts. And he invested it in Paul. And it was Paul's responsibility to make it known. So now, the idea, some people will mistakenly look at this verse and think, well, so you're saying that grace had never been known, God never extended grace in time past, and, and grace is a new concept with the Apostle Paul? And I've been challenged on that before, and people want to dismiss dispensational truth because they think that's what's being said. But that's not what the verse says. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God has always been gracious, even with the giving of the law and the thunderings and the earthquake and the lightning and everything that took place on Mount Sinai with the giving of the law where the people were scared and they cried out, say, Moses, you speak to us. Don't let God speak to us anymore because they were scared for their lives. Even that thundering God was gracious. You know what? Moses asked God, he said, God, show me your glory. And one, God says, I'll pass by you and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. And he, he proclaimed a whole list of names and one of them was gracious. See, God has always been filled with grace. But that doesn't mean that He always dealt with people in a dispensation of grace. Israel, He dealt with through covenants. And once He gave those covenants, they were binding and God had no leeway to operate differently from those covenants. He bound Himself to them. But today, we're not under those covenants. And today, well, with the, with the salvation of Saul of Tarsus, at that moment, the world was more ripe than it had ever been for the judgment of God to fall. In fact, it was the judgment that God had promised. Instead, God interrupted it, set Israel aside, and opened up a whole new opportunity of salvation through the preaching of the cross. And that's why it's called the dispensation of the grace of God. Every day is a day of grace because the world is fully deserving of the wrath of God, 
But the wrath of God is on hold as long as this dispensation of grace is intact, which w- it will end with the rapture. And by the way, Paul doesn't give any sign of an eclipse as a sign that the rapture is about to happen. The sign that Paul gives that the rapture is about to have it happen is when you see the Lord and you're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's the next sign that exists for the world. And that's only for believers. So it's a waste of time to keep chasing after these signs when the next one that will happen is just the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's, that's what Paul taught. Now, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're looking now at the, the fact that dispensational truth did not start with John Nelson Darby. But it's been evident in Scripture. So Paul says, I was given the dispensation of the grace of God for you Gentiles. He said it was before a mystery. It was hidden in God. And we could read a lot more verses to back that up. There, further down in Ephesians chapter 3 or in Colossians chapter 1, Romans chapter 16, there's a whole number of verses we could go to, to to continue to bear that out, that Paul was given a whole bunch of new information, new revelation regarding what God was doing today for the Gentiles. Calling out a body of Christ where there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. <clears throat> But here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, there is a very interesting verse. Look at verse 7. So these are some of the... 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul is writing. He, he's about to be killed. And he's writing to his, his spiritual son Timothy, trying to exhort him to remain strong in the faith. That's what he says there in verse 1. He says, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So he's given some important instruction for Timothy to carry on sound doctrine in light of Paul's death and departure. In verse 7 he says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Now, I personally can, can align myself with that verse, the truthfulness of that verse if I can say it that way. And I know some of you in this room can as well. When you give special consideration to what the Apostle Paul said, it brings understanding in all things. And that doesn't mean that you automatically understand all of Scripture front to back. It means it brings a level of understanding in all areas. Because all of the confusion that exists today, I believe, you know, there is a smorgasbord of Christianity. It's like a buffet. You just go choose whether you want dessert or an appetizer or or meat that's old and stale and been up there for several hours, or you've got options at a buffet. In Christianity, you've got options. There's all kinds of options. It's a smorgasbord. You know what I think brings absolute clarity to where you understand why people believe what they... You understand why that denomination believes that way, this one believes that way. When you understand what Paul says, it brings clarity in all things. You're like, oh yeah, they believe that because they're taking Israel's doctrine and resting on that when that wasn't intended for us. They're looking for that eclipse as being a sign of judgment for God when God has always sent a prophet to warn of judgment first. And He always does that for Israel. And the list could go on and on, but when you understand the dispensation of grace that we're living in, and that was given to and through the Apostle Paul, and you give special consideration to what he says, then it opens up understanding in all things. And it is a wonderful thing. Now, Look on down to 2 Timothy 2.15. Verse 15. And this says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we've, we've talked about this verse a lot in the past. 
And in the King James Bible, it's the only verse that tells us to study. And therefore, it's, it's only logical that it would tell us how to study. And it tells us, first of all, we don't study to show ourselves approved unto the pastor. We don't need to study to show ourselves approved unto the church. We don't need to study to show ourselves approved unto our parents. We don't need to study to show ourselves approved or Im impressive to our fellow Christians. We study to show ourselves approved unto God. Because every one of us is accountable to God. Every one of us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ will someday stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of ourselves, not to give an account of someone else, not for someone else, our pastor, to give an account of us. We each individually will stand there to give an account. So it's imperative upon each one of us to... We, we all have different capabilities. We all have different uh, capacities. God, God understands that. That's okay. But yet, we still all are accountable to God. And we all have the ability... To, to understand basic Bible truth, and we should strive for that. Some of us may go deeper than others. That's okay. But basic Bible truth is something we should all lean into and want to have a handle on. So we want to be approved unto God. Now, next, it's a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. In other words, you can be ashamed. All, all those predictors who will say tomorrow is the end of the world, they will be ashamed. They will be let down. There's been a lot of predictors in the past. Uh, there's the one, uh, Harold Camping, I believe, notorious in the past 20 years for making multiple predictions. Every one of them was wrong. I don't know how he kept living with himself. But he had to be ashamed. But there's a way to not be ashamed, and that's by rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, this doesn't say dividing truth from error. Interesting, isn't it? Because some people don't realize that. That's what they think when they read it. It's rightly dividing. You have the word of truth. This is the word of truth. And the, and the, and the scriptures say rightly divide it. Everybody should divide evil from good. Everybody naturally does that to some degree or another, whether they know the Scriptures or not. But that's not what this verse is saying. It's saying rightly divide the word of truth because there is some truth given, given in a dispensation past to Israel. Now, there's all, all Scripture is, is profitable, right? All Scripture is profitable. As, as we just read there in, in 2 Timothy 3.16, and 17, all Scripture is profitable, but as C.R. Stam once said, it's only profitable if we rightly divide it. If you think you need to go back into Israel's program and say, keep the law, keep the Ten Commandments, and if you're, if you're living uh, good enough, getting close enough to those Ten Commandments, then you'll be saved, you put a curse on yourself. It's not, the Scripture's not profiting you anymore. It's profitable if you rightly divide it. And even today, to the degree that people rightly divide the word of truth is the degree to which they're profited. Because you see, some people believe that salvation is through the finished work of the cross, that Jesus died for my sin, that, that I died with Him, that He was buried and I was buried with Him, and He was rose again to newness of life, and through that I have resurrection of eternal life. And I stand before God justified because of what Christ has done. That's the gospel. But you know what? You don't find that outside of Paul's epistles. People may try to read that information into other scriptures, but that is Paul's gospel that he talks about, my gospel. So they may not rightly divide the word of truth in all areas, but if they're trusting in that gospel, they have rightly divided on at least one important issue, right? 
because there's multiple Gospels. We just went through a, a series on that um, a few months ago about the different Gospels in the Bible. There's the Gospel of the Kingdom. There's, uh, that's the main one. And then the Gospel of Grace, or the Gospel of Christ, being the two in, uh, in, in distinction to one another. But the Gospel of the Kingdom has nothing to do with the finished work of the cross. Now, I should rephrase that. It has something to do with it, but it doesn't explain it. <clears throat> so it's important to rightly divide the word of truth. And that brings us to a dispensational perspective. We have to understand God today in the dispensation of grace is doing something different than in time past with Israel. Now, <clears throat> So with that, we can see, and that's just touching the surface, we can see the Bible already promotes a dispensational view of itself, of understanding how God is, is working. Now, in the Bible's ultimate authority, the second point that that pastor shared with me, we'll look at that. What, what about this larger universal church, believers, uh, no matter where they are in the world and their position on a specific issue or a doctrine. Should we give weight to that? And you know, I already mentioned the majority in, in most cases has been utterly wrong. And, and we'll look at a few verses, but I'll just bring to memory. Do you remember one of the, the most catastrophic events in all of human history in Noah's flood? And there's been estimates put out there. I don't know what, what it is. But in Noah's day, there were at least millions of people, likely many millions, possibly billions. We don't even know for sure the extent of the, the technology and the, the amount of people. You know, they were living long life back then. They weren't, they weren't dying at 60, 70, 80 years old like modern times. They were living to, to six, seven hundred, eight hundred, even nine hundred years old. And so you think about how the population could explode. And so there was countless people on the earth. And God saw how evil it was. But not just evil, violent. It was so bloody violent. That's one of the things that Genesis mentions. That it grieved God at the violence on the earth. And so he, he warns Noah to build this massive ark. And he says, I'm giving man 120 years, which is the amount of time it took Noah to build that ark. 120 years, news traveled around the world that there was a massive ark being built because God, the supposed God of Noah, was going to destroy the world. Ample time for all the earth to hear the news and hear the warning. How many people got on that ark? Peter says, eight souls. Eight souls. What would happen if Noah or one of his sons would have trusted in the majority? And said, well, let's just, let's just, let's just do some surveying. and Let's see what most people think about this. Noah didn't entertain that. He just went with what God said. That should be our attitude as well. We shouldn't be concerned. Now, it, it can be informative to know what most Christians think. It can be informative to read surveys about how different Christians believe different doctrines and, and what denominations believe what and all that and, and in our modern time. It's okay to learn that, but that shouldn't carry any weight as to whether we believe it or not. The majority on spiritual matters has always been wrong. <clears throat> now, as we think about Israel's history, so God created Israel. He started with Abraham, called out one man, began dealing specifically with him. He grew the nation there in Egypt, and it was God's nation. Remember, it's a covenant people. It's God built the nation out of it from scratch. He said, I'm going to build a nation that will glorify my name. He called him out of Egypt. He said, I, I've got the promised land ahead of you. It's filled with the Canaanites, but I'm going to send you in there. And this is after a miraculous deliverance from Egypt. 
He said, I'm going to send you in there to overtake it because it's your land. I have promised it to you, Israel. He says, you will go in there. I will deliver your enemies into your hands. God had emphatically promised it. And so as, they, as Moses leads them out and they near the promised land, and he sends in 12 spies representing the 12 tribes of Israel to scope out the land before they enter in. And you know what? Those spies come back. 12 of them and two of them said, let's go in because God has promised to give it us. Ten of them said, we can't do it. We can't. Call it. There's giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers. We can't do it. God had never said that they could do it. God said that He would do it for them. They were just supposed to go in believing the promise of God, but out of the 12 spies, 10 of them forsook the promise of God and said, we can't do it. So they asked the people, what do you want to do? The nation of Israel. You know what? Israel as a whole, they sided with the ten. They said, no, we, we're not able. And they were sad and dejected. We can't do it. You know, from the, the people of Israel, age 20 years and up, you know how many of them actually got into that promised land? Two. Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that came back and said, we can, we can go in. All the rest of them, God let die. He, he let them wander around in that wilderness for 40 years until they had all died off. He's like, fine, if you're not going to believe the promise of me, you're going to reject my promise. You're going to say you can't do it because you're rejecting the promise of God. He said, fine, I'll let you die in the wilderness. But the two that did believe, they got in. Now think about this. I think it mentions at one point men of war in Israel, so age 20 years and upward, able-bodied men, I think it mentioned 600,000 as it was coming out of Egypt. So there were several million people in the nation of Israel at this time. Perhaps we could kind of gauge that out of uh, maybe 600,000 men. Two people got into the promised land. Two people stood on the promise of God. Now, there might have been a few more that died. Moses was one of them. He didn't forsake the promise, but he got old and died and didn't enter the, the promised land. But two people don't trust the majority. Now, as we, as we even go through Israel's history further, in the days of Elijah the prophet, remember, at this time, Israel is, is fully worshiping idols. Is it Ahab? Ahab? I think Ahab is the king and Jezebel, his wife, are ruling at the time. And they're wicked. I mean, they're, they are evil rulers. And Elijah is like, I'm the only one left. Now, we can find that in Romans chapter, um, Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9. In fact, I'll verse, break in verse 27. This is Isaiah, actually. We'll, we'll get to Elijah in the next chapter. But Romans 9, 27 says, Isaiah crieth concerning Israel, though the number of children of Israel be of the sand of sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he shall finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and made like unto Gomorrah. So he's like, Isaiah even witnessed the fact that it was only a small number of Israel in his day. It was a remnant. The majority of Israel were, even though they were the chosen people of God, even though they had the Scriptures, even though they proclaimed to be Bible-believing Israelites, they weren't. They were actually in opposition to God. Only a small remnant were actually true believers. Now, jump on down to verse, uh, chapter 10. <clears throat> Actually, go to 11, chapter 11. And, and Paul says in verse, verse 1, he says, I say then, hath God cast away His people? God forbid. In other words, God's not done with Israel. And He, he didn't close the door on Israel's opportunity to be saved just because he, 
began doing something new with the Apostle Paul. He says, For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What he not saith the scripture... What the scripture saith of Elias, so this is a, um, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. So this is, if you go back in the Old Testament, he's crying out to God. And he's convinced he's the only one that believes in God anymore in Israel. In Bible-believing Israel, in the ones that had the Scripture, this isn't. This is not even taking into account all the the millions of Gentiles who had already rebelled against God and forsaken God. Now there might have been a few random Gentiles here and there that trusted in God and maybe had heard about Him through Israel or through the Scriptures, but that was not the norm. That's the exception. Even in Israel, it was not the norm to be a true believer. But verse 4 says, But what saith the answer of God? He says, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So God has always maintained a remnant. God knows where they are. We may feel insignificant. We may feel like there's hardly anybody that really believes. But God has believers. We may not know them, but God has believers. <clears throat> now, I think that's enough for us to get to the point across for throughout human history. The majority is not to be trusted. And so we don't want to just go along blindly, even the majority of a, a religious organization, or you know, just don't judge stuff by the numbers. So that we could apply that to us. This is a small church by the standards of churches around us. But don't judge it by the numbers. Judge it by the Word of God. How are the other churches, and I'm not trying to just have a critical attitude, I'm just, it's a, it's a question we need to look at. How are the other churches stacking up to the Word of God if they are good for them? And we'd be glad to support them. But if they're not, maybe it's time to look elsewhere. But don't be alarmed when a large church is deviating from the Word of God or there's only a small church that seems to be more focused on it. <clears throat> Now, that brings us to the point, you don't need, with dispensational truth, you don't need to follow the majority to see that the Bible upholds it. It's, it's um, something we want to find in Scripture, not worry about people saying, oh, you're just uh, following John Nelson Darby and it's a modern adventure, invention or, or whatever. That's not true. I don't believe in dispensational doctrine because John Nelson Darby taught it. I believe it because I find it in Scripture. <clears throat> now, what about the third point? Church history. As we think about the, the history of the church and their position on uh, dispensational truth. Now, this can be intimidating. I've had this challenge from, from multiple people. Say, well, if, they're, if the right division, rightly dividing the word of truth and the dispensational doctrine that you're promoting... If that's true, why isn't there more evidence of it down through church history? And I remember the first time I was challenged with that, it was like, I mean, I knew what I was seeing in Scripture, so it didn't, it didn't cause me to waver. It was like, I don't know, I don't know what to do with that. that. That's kind of frustrating. I wish there was more. But since then, I've learned to think differently about that. And I remember even a time... Uh, years ago, when I started becoming fascinated, as I was trying to sort out what I believe and, and the church that I had belonged to, I realized was um, missing some important issues and, and maybe heading down the wrong road. And so I was like, I've got to make a change, but what do I believe? So as I was trying to sort all that out, I remember becoming fascinated with the early church fathers. And I don't know if any of you have heard of them, but uh, about the... It might have started in the second century slightly, but the uh, third century um, become more prolific. There was a lot of writings. So this is so you've got the Bible written during the time of Jesus and the early apostles, and the Apostle Paul specifically, the Apostle John in their lifetime. It became complete. 
and it was final. Then you've got a gap of time, like maybe a hundred years, where you don't really find much. There's a lot of war going on. Israel was, you know, 70 AD. Jerusalem is destroyed. I think there's reasons why you don't find much. A lot of chaos and turmoil in the world. But then about a hundred years later, you start finding writings of prominent Christian people, and it's called the early church fathers. And for, for then the next couple hundred years, there's extensive writings from um, you maybe heard of some of the Tortilius and, and Origen, uh, Clement of Alexander, um, Justin, uh, is it Justin Martyr, I believe? Uh, there's, there's a number of others. And so they have all these writings. And so a lot of people have, have and I went down this road to at least investigate, have given a lot of weight to what they wrote because they're closer to the apostles. They're closer to the original church. And you know what I found? In fact, I've got a book in my, in my office called A Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs. And this one author had become fascinated with it to the point where he compiled, I, he, he evidently fully embraced the, the teaching of the early church fathers, and so he compiled a book that you can look up a subject and under that subject, it's almost like a, it calls it a dictionary, it's almost like an encyclopedia. It will have all the different um, writings, specific statements that all these church fathers have written about that subject. So it's a real quick way to learn what they thought about the doctrine of salvation or doctrine of hell or the doctrine of heaven or the, the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ or the, the deity of Christ and, and, and the cross of Christ. And you can look up all these things. You know what I found in that book? Very little of grace. It was works-based legalism through and through. And so it didn't take me long to just dismiss that. But you know what? That shouldn't marvel. That shouldn't uh, marvel any of us as we think about that. The early church fathers being a hundred years or more removed from the, the, the completion of the Word of God because... Look in second or First Timothy chapter one. In the Apostle Paul's day, and later in his life, when he was writing First Timothy and Second Timothy, we see a departure from sound doctrine in his day. Now, First Timothy chapter one. Uh, verse 3, it says, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. In other words, there, Paul's seeing an issue here. There's new doctrines being taught that he had not taught them. And he's telling Timothy, he says, you need to charge those people. Don't teach any other doctrine than, than what, we have, what we have given. Now, <clears throat> verse 6. Well, verse, we'll start in verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned from which, how many? Some. From which some, having swerved, having turned aside into vain jangling. Now that vain jangling is a very interesting term. We don't have time to get into that. But what I want to see is in, in 1 Timothy, later in Paul's life, there's issues cropping up, false doctrine. He's saying, some have turned aside from what I've taught. He said, Timothy, you need to be aware of these, and you need to charge people to get back to the right doctrine. Um, now, jump down to, well, you know, starting in verse 11, he says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust, and he goes through his, his ministry and how he was saved in verse um, Verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on Him to life everlasting. So Paul is the pattern of salvation. So he reemphasized that. Timothy already knew that. But Paul is reemphasizing this is an important issue to stand on because there's people departing from sound doctrine. Now, um, Verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, O son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and good conscience, which, notice, 
some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And then he names a couple people. So we see here in 1 Timothy, some are departing from sound doctrine. <clears throat> now turn over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is a number of years later. <clears throat> and um, we'll break in verse 10. 2 Timothy verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So Paul says, I'm suffering all this stuff because of the, the revelation given to me and the preaching of the gospel that was committed to me. He said, I'm, I'm suffering all this. Verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. Notice that. In faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Now verse 15, this thou knowest, that all, notice it, in verse 1 Timothy it was some. Now in 2 Timothy he says, all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. And then he mentions a couple prominent people. Now think about that. These are not folks who are denying the Lord Jesus Christ, at least in, the, in their mind. These are not people who are burning their Bibles. These are people who are teaching the Bible, teaching the Scripture, <coughs> promoting that they are still Christians, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're turning away from Paul's doctrine. And so it's no wonder that when we come a hundred plus years later, the writings of the early church fathers are almost completely void of the grace of God. And it's filled with legalism and bondage and authority and heavy-handed authority and the setting up of, of bishops and reverends and cardinals and ultimately a pope. Developing authority structure. By the way, when Paul, we don't have time to look into this. When Paul wrote his epistles, and he wrote them to like the church of Ephesus and, and the Galatians, and did he write those epistles to the pastor outside of Timothy? Timothy might, and Titus might be an exception. But to those others, did he write it to the pastor or to the church board or to the bishop over these five churches? or to the cardinal, or to the pope, and say, fix this, fix this, teach this. He wrote it to the churches. In some place he calls it the churches, some place he calls it the saints. The authority structure that arose in early Christian history was not biblical. It was based largely on Israel's authority structure, the priestly system, and biblically, the Word of God is the authority. I have no authority. in it. The only authority I have as a pastor is teaching the Word of God. But as a church, everyone is responsible for the direction of the church. And if Paul was writing a letter today, he would write it to the saints at Day of Grace. And everyone plays a part as we all edify one another. The authority structure that has arisen out of Christianity and developed into denominationalism is not biblical. When churches lose their autonomy and their independence and, and they answer to a higher authority or a different organization outside of their assembly, it's not biblical. doesn't mean there can't be saved people in those churches, but the organization is unbiblical. Now, <clears throat> all of that, and, and the, the Roman Catholic Church throughout history became the dominant force. So they wrote the history. You know, they, they persecuted, killed, imprisoned, 
And not only that, they burnt books and writings that did not agree with Roman Catholic doctrine. Now, if you want to investigate further into the history of, of the grace movement, grace believers, Brian Ross at Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a number of years ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago, did a Bible history project. A great, I'm sorry, a grace history project, I think. It's an excellent resource. It's a very lengthy study into the history of grace believers. And you have to dig deep, but he found traces of it all throughout history. But they were always, very little of their own writings is more about what other people wrote about to him because the Roman Catholic Church would burn their books every time they would wage war on them. And we know that the winner of a war writes the history of that war. And it's not always accurate. So when we come to the idea that church history carries any weight, it doesn't. It was only in the last uh, several hundred years with the Protestant movement that there's been enough freedom from the Roman Catholic Church for more divergent and, 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 and a dispensational view to be written about without it being extinguished. And so that's why we see it more prominent today. And so there's been some that said, well, um, dispensational doctrine was, was lost and has been found again. But that's not true. It was willfully abandoned. People walked away from it willfully. It happened in Paul's day. But thank God, through the, the ability of the printing press and writing and modern books, now it's able to be, and, and the lack of persecution from religious organizations in the Western world has allowed for it to expand again. And people can, can learn from it and understand it and read about it. And so, so praise God for that. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the dispensational doctrine right division that we talk about is not a modern invention. It's always been in the pages of Scripture. I'm not saying we have everything figured out. I'm not saying I have all the answers. But I do believe it's always been in the pages of Scriptures, and I don't need outside sources to confirm it. I just need to confirm it by the Word of God. And hopefully you have the same, same attitude. Now, understanding that, I'll reemphasize that one verse. If you understand this, it's like the light bulb turns on for many people. And as Paul said, told Timothy, he said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. I have found that to be true. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the completed Word of God, for the Scriptures that are able to make us perfect, complete, and thoroughly furnished. And Father, we do pray that each one of us would have a heart to discern everything through the lens of Scripture. And as we encounter things in life and, and spiritual understanding and, and doctrine and teaching, even teaching here at this church, let us each one be found studying the Scriptures, whether these things be so. Father, we do pray for each one here that as we go forth this week, that we would have a desire to minister the Word of God, to share the, the salvation and the love and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to those around us. And we pray all this for His glory and in His name. Amen.